Welcome to New Bedford. I'm so glad that you, you're coming to see us today. Uh, we're going to see a lot of the very, very historic areas of a small section of New Bedford. New Bedford is very, very lucky to have a huge history, really. Um, it started with the whaling industry and then continued on through the textile industry. Really, New Bedford was formed in its current state by the development of the textile industry. Um, it was a kind of a, a small but well, sort of well-to-do and thriving seaport town. But the textile industry changed the whole character of the city. We're going to talk about both aspects and talk about some of the important people that made that happen over the years. And this particular property is one of the signature properties in New Bedford. The character of the property has changed quite a bit. It's quite commercial now. And they've just recently changed the designation of this property to a uh, nonprofit, the Wam Sutter or the James Arnold Mansion, which is the name of this mansion, is now it's a it's a nonprofit. They're trying to bring the house back and re reinterpret the history of the of the property. Um, at, for a long time, um, prior to that, and it still is, was a private club. It was the club in the club, as you know, is if in these cities where all the business and all the transactions of the city were, tra were, were, were conducted in this building. The Wamsutta Club was a very, very exclusive place for about 100 years. Not 100 years, maybe 50 years. Anyway, original origins of the house was a man by the name of James Arnold. He was a Quaker from Providence, came to New Bedford, and like many famous and, and, and well-to-do people, married into the richest family in town. <laughs> His uh, wife was a Roach. You're going to hear a lot about the Roach family over the next hour. R-O-T-C-H is how they spelled their name, Roach. Um, they, were the, they were the people that brought the whaling industry to New Bedford from Nantucket in the years just prior to the American Revolution. But um, James Arnold was, uh, became very successful here in, in New Bedford, born around 17. 80, I believe, died in 1868. He purchased this property around 1819, built a house. If you were in the, in the foyer, just if you know, you saw a, a painting of what the house looked like when it was built in 1819. It was a federal style, a nice federal style. There were bigger ones and grander ones in New Bedford at this time. Considering his wealth, it's kind of a modest house. But there were, he bought 11 acres on this site and he developed one of the most beautiful horticultural sites in New England at that time. He traveled all over the world collecting plants, bringing them back to New Bedford, was well known for it, um, and it was a place that is, was well visited by the public. He actually opened his gardens to the public, which was almost revolutionary at that time. He knew he was getting old. He wanted to give the property and the gardens to the city, and the city declined the offer. The city declined the offer. So when Arnold died, in his will, he set aside $100,000 to Harvard University. And the, the request only said, please use this money for a horticultural purpose. And Harvard University, or Harvard College at the time, bought a huge amount of land in Jamaica Plain, and formed the Arnold Arboretum. The Arnold Arboretum is named after James Arnold here in New Bedford. And that beautiful park, really, even more so than, than this site, is the lasting legacy of, of Arnold. After James Arnold passed away, the house, the house itself passed to his nephew, who were, whose, house were, whose house, original house we're going to see at the, the, one of the last properties on the tour. Beautiful house as well. And he moved into the property and completely uh, modernized the house at the time, 1870s, into a very grand Victorian. Uh, photographs of, lots of photographs of the house at that time. <laughs> it's really over the top. Probably the most over the top Victorian built in the city. All kinds of turrets and stuff. You can't see any of that stuff anymore. It's all been taken down. But some of the grandeur of the remodel is in the doorways. Because that's, those are part of the remaining parts of the uh, of the Victorian um, uh, re remodeling. I always felt, I always was p puzzled by this particular fireplace, the one you're standing in front. This is one of the most 
beautifully carved fireplaces in marble that you'll find anywhere. And I originally thought, because of the amount of money that William J. Roach, who was the guy who took over the property uh, during that time, he had enough money to, to, to put this in. But the period of this fireplace is really the 1850s. And I think that James Arnold um, added these fireplaces, this one and that one, which are basically the same fireplace, hand-carved Carrara marble from the famous Carrara uh, 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 quarry in Rome, um, and this is and this is the. But I think it was actually James Arnold put this in. It looks more like an 1850s um, mantelpiece than um, uh, an 1870s. It would, 1870s mantelpiece would be much different looking. So that was probably one of the last real, real improvements that Arnold made to the priory. Certainly has a horticultural theme. To it. And it does. It has a horticultural theme. It's loaded with with plants, and that's one of the other big clues, really. I mean, if you know the history, and it, you know, it was kind of silly of me even to think about that it could have come from other than anybody, because it's all called cultural films. After that, uh, the, the building was lived in by uh, the Roach family for, for about 30 years, and then after that it passed to the, the club purchased the property around 1900, and that's when it started to um, occupied the site and still does today actually it's still the warm side of club it's the part of it is I don't know how they've arranged this is this, this new thing where it's the James Arnold mansion and not the warm side of club anymore that's a very new thing I'm not sure how they managed to, to do that and do both functions but they have um, so that's a sort of a brief summary maybe not so brief summary of the of this particular property when we go outside it's really difficult when you look back at the house to see any of the old style um, the original federal style houses there if you just strip off the top floor and some of the corners and so forth you can sort of see the original house lots of the Victorian decorations all been stripped away um, this house is still an attractive property but the, the antique uh, charm of the original building is kind of lost the house here is the Samuel Rodman Jr. house and Samuel Rodman Built this house in 1828. It's kind of a plain, very plain style for the times, actually. Um, he was a very, he was a member of the other very important family during the early years of the Bedford Whaling, the Rodmans. Uh, his father was, um, when you go downtown and see the visitor center, you'll see the Rodman. You might notice the Rodman candle works. That was the father built the candle works for uh, whale oil candles. Um, very well to do guy. And his son lived in this house, and he was also a very successful merchant. And he's very important in history because he kept a very, very detailed diary of life in New Bedford from, that's been published and, and known. He probably did more of it, but has, it's unknown. From 1821 to 1859. And he comments on all the, there were so many interesting things that happened. The next thing that we're going to talk, one of the next things we're going to talk about Lots of the original documentation about, the, about it was from Rodman's diary. Um, a very interesting guy. He was a whaler. He was a whaling merchant. Um, had a counting house downtown. He was a very, very uh, successful guy. Um, and, one of the, and there's so many stories that I tell when we go to this, with this house. But one of the most interesting things to me is, at one point, he went to visit his wife's family on Long Island, in Flushing, Long Island. Quite a Quaker community, actually, in Long Island, in Hempstead, Flushing, in that lower end, just, just outside of Brooklyn. And he decided to go overland. Now, he could have taken a steamer at this time when he went on this trip. It was in the late 1820s. There were steamships he could have taken. He decided to go overland from New Bedford to Long Island. It took him eight days. Eight days in 1820 to go from New Bedford to Long Island. 30, that's basically it's 30 miles a day and it's kind of what, what they did because the first day they stopped in Swansea for lunch and they spent the first night in Providence so that's about 30 miles from here. I mean really that is a trek. Really you know and he probably took servants probably took a whole entourage of things with him. He had another story his best friend and brother-in-law actually was a man by the name of Charles W. Morgan the whale ship Charles W. Morgan was named after a real person. And he was a successful merchant as well, and Samuel Rodman's um, brother-in-law. And he took a steamer to Philadelphia once. He took everything he had, all his household goods practically, 
his carriage and horses went on the steamer, as well as his servants. And it took. It was like. And and Rodman was. I think even Rodman was a little astonished that he would go to this length to take to take to go to a strip. So that's the type of detail. The life of what it was like uh, to live here. You know, he partially designed, oversaw the 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 building of the house. You know, they had. You know, the things you got to remember: no sewage system, no public water. All that type of stuff he talks about, you know, life, what life was like, even for rich people. One thing to remember about early New Bedford is the importance of Quaker Society of Friends Society here in New Bedford. And this is the symbol of, uh, of New Bedford's uh, Quaker heritage, the Friends Meeting House, built in around 1822. The yellow building is actually the first Friends Meeting House in New Bedford. That was on this site. And they moved it there when they built this building. The other, the other important aspect of Quaker society in New Bedford was that they were anti-slavery. Um, and they had developed a reputation for abolitionism well before 1830s when Frederick Douglass, one of the most famous African-American, the most famous African-Americans in the 19th century in America, uh, escaped from slavery and ended up in this house in 1838. His wife had already uh, escaped slavery and somehow, I don't know how, they met up in New York and came to New Bedford because New Bedford was known to protect fugitive slaves. New Bedford wasn't just a stop on the Underground Railroad was actually a destination because they were, they were pretty sure, sure that they could be protected here. In fact, in the very early pages of Moby Dick, when Ishmael comes to New Bedford, maybe in the first two or three pages, Ishmael comes to New Bedford. Now, I've, learned, I've done a lot of research on, on Moby Dick, that's the New Bedford part, because it's interesting, you know. It's, autobi it's completely autobiographical. Those sections that, that he writes about New Bedford in the very early pages of uh, Moby Dick when, he's, when he first comes to New Bedford, autobiographical. All those things that he did, that he saw, happened. One of the first things he's doing, he goes to the waterfront looking for a place to stay for the night. It's pitch black down there. He can't see anything, really. He says it. Um, so every time he sees a little light, he opens the door to see if it's, if it's a tavern, because he's looking for a particular tavern at the time so he could stay. He opens the door. Tavern. 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 A tavern, yeah. Gotcha. A tavern. Um, and so he opens his one door, and immediately everybody turns around, looks at him, and it's a black congregation. <laughs> and they're probably scared, you know what, because this is not a slave catcher. You know, he thinks, oh, they just have. He doesn't say that, though. It's kind of funny. I thought he would say it. He doesn't say that. But nonetheless, there's a huge crowd in this, in this building down by the waterfront, and apparently they're being preached to by another. So anyway, the point of it was there were a lot here. They saw, saw this as a destination as well as a pass-through, and, uh, and Fr Frederick Douglass certainly um, saw it as a destination because he spent a few years here living at this house. He worked on the waterfront. He worked uh, caulking uh, the ships. Every whaler, uh, every wooden ship in those days, if they went on any kind of a lengthy voyage, they had to completely resheathe the bottom of the ship because of worms and other types of stuff that would attach itself to the to the hulls below the waterline. So every ship had to be um, uh, recalked and resheathed every year, and that's the job that Douglas got. He worked for a guy named George Holland, whose house we're going to go by. We're not going to talk about that house, but it was a pretty important whaleman. And he says about Holland, he was a tough taskmaster, but a good paymaster. Good enough. There was good enough. Yep. Although Douglas and all the blacks that were, that were trying to get work, it was difficult for them. I mean, uh, uh, George Holland a Sr. Was, uh, was, was a strict Quaker, and he probably told the men, you put up with this guy or else, you know. Um, but so he had, he had work here. Um, and he, was, he started to, he went to the local AME church, American, African Methodist Church, Episcopal Church, became a well-known speaker, and his career took off after that. He had a lot of encouragement from Quakers and from William Lloyd Garrison, who was uh, one of the primary abolitionists of the day. The house behind me, the yellow one, uh, it's a nice house, uh, sort of a late federal style. 
built in, it says 1837, but I think that's a little bit earlier than that, probably closer to 1830 or 1820. It doesn't matter the year. It doesn't matter what the house style is for this particular story. This is a story about a person who was born here. Her name was Henrietta Howland Robinson, and born in 1834. And she grew up to accumulate a fortune of $150 million and was the richest person, the richest woman in the country, maybe the richest woman, self-made woman that ever lived, actually. May all, maybe Oprah, maybe Oprah and some of that she might have more money than, than as it turns out. But in, in, when she died in 1916, her $150 million fortune, which she earned for the most part herself, was probably worth 15 to $20 billion in today's money. And she did it um, in the typical ruthless way that, that sharp financiers uh, will do things. Uh, she was born here in New Bedford in uh, 1834 in this house. Her father was named Edward Robinson. His mother was, again, Edward Robinson was a New Yorker, came to New Bedford, married again into the rich, one of the richest families in town, uh, one of the Howland uh, whaling interests, very, very well to do. And uh, Robinson married the, the, uh, the whaleman's, uh, whaling merchant's daughter. Her name was Abby Howland. And they had one child, and that was uh, Henrietta Hetty Green. Um, Hetty um, was, learned all her financial acumen, apparently, from sitting at her father's knee, who was extremely uh, sharp whaling merchant. Nobody pulled the wool over of, of Edward Robinson's eyes. Um, he ran the uh, Isaac Holland Jr. A, a fortune and whaling fortune for many years up until 18, the late 1850s. Um, Howland, I mean Robinson, the interesting about uh, Hetty Green's father, Robinson, Edward Robinson, almost the moment that oil was discovered in Pennsylvania in 1859, Edward Robinson left town. He said, that's it, whale oil is done. And he knew it right away. I mean, whaling wasn't over. Whaling didn't end in New Bedford officially when the last wooden whaler went out in 1926. So we had a lot of years left of whaling. But the big money in whaling was over and Robinson knew it. He left town. Um, he went to New York, continued to make money in the stock market. You know, there was so much during the Civil War, there was so much underhanded stuff that could be done to make money during the Civil War. And he was one of those guys. He died in 1865 and left Hetty a fortune of about five to ten million dollars. Not small change by any stretch of the imagination. But Hetty, over the next few decades of her life, wheeled and dealed, bought high, I mean bought low and sold high, constantly, constantly beat the boys at their own game and accumulated a huge fortune. She was uh, known as a, a, a miser in the way she lived, didn't spend any money on herself. Um, some of that is anti-feminist to a large degree, really. No, no, she was an eccentric. There's no two ways about that. She was, a, she was an eccentric. But she made huge amounts of money. And uh, always, and the other thing about Hetty, that she, one of her principles, always have lots of cash on hand. Always have lots of cash on hand. Can't make a deal unless you have a lot of cash on hand. So she made, she made a lot of it. Her life story is very, very interesting. There's been a number of books, old books and new books, written about her. If you have any interest in history whatsoever, she is a person to read about because her life is very compelling. She had two children. Her son was kind of a, actually, the only, the only liability she had to carry for her whole life was her husband, who was also a financier, who lost more money than he made, and Hetty was constantly bailing him out. She finally said, well, look, I'm going to put you up in the nicest place in town. Just quit. Okay, and that's basically because she was the only person who was losing the money. Her son was a very adept investor as well. His daughter, her daughter was a very retiring, kind of like Eddie's mother. Um, Eddie put her up in the best hotel in New York um, and so forth and constantly tried to squelch any suitor because they figured that she was just that, they were just after Eddie's mother. But eventually she did marry a man by the name of Wilkes. <coughs> So Hetty died in 1916. The fortune went to, to the children. Edward, her son, died in, in the mid-30s. He made a lot of money as well. And then the fortune finally passed to uh, Sylvia, whose name was Sylvia Ann Howland Green Wilkes. 
when she died in 1951, she had the remnants of the, of the fortune after, after all the taxes and all the spending was about $90 million. And she used a lot of that, the, the library system in New Bedford got a huge portion of that, not a huge portion, but a, a big portion of that money. We were one of the benefactors. But when Sylvia died in 1951, she had a checking account, a non-interest bearing checking account of $30 million. Just like her mother said, keep a lot of cash on hand at all times. Interesting lady, um, the family, <laughs> to say the least. The son is a story all to himself, which I could go on for another 20 minutes about. But anyway, if, you have it, if you're interested in, in biography, there's been a bunch of biogra biographies of, of Hetty Green, some of them quite recent. It's worth a look. This is the, um, the Roach Jones Duff House and Garden Museum. This is the, uh, the main house museum here in New Bedford. It really interprets three time frames of, of New Bedford's history. The late whaling, actually the golden age of whaling, uh, as well as the Victorian era where uh, a, ma a lady by the name of Amelia Jones spent most of her, the time of the house's existence in her, her uh, ownership. And then the Duff family owned it up until 1985, actually. So they try, to, they try to cover all aspects of that history. It's a nice building on the inside, but the highlight really is the beautiful garden here that they have. It's a beautiful property. But the main person to talk, this is where we're going to talk about the history of the whaling and how it came to New Bedford. This house was the home of uh, William Roach Jr. And William Roach Jr. was the son of uh, and grandson of the founders of a very, very important whaling house in Nantucket. It uh, started in the 1720s, actually. And they, made, they were very, very successful by the 1750s. And by the 1760s, they were sort of a Oh, it was an international company. They owned all aspects of their business, from the ships to the shipping, to everything. There was a, it was like a vertically integrated business. And, we, and they decided, the grand, William Roach Jr.'s grandfather decided that Nantucket might not be the ideal place for growth, for any number of reasons. One of the reasons is everything had to be shipped, to Nant, even in the 1760s. Everything had to be shipped to Nantucket. Food, you know, water, supplies, everything. So I think he felt that, let's, let's find a place. And they decided on New Bedford. Right by, the, right by the water's edge, where the big state pier is in New Bedford, the harbor is very, very deep. It's like a deep trench right by the shore. So it was a perfect deep water harbor. And as it turned out, Nantucket had a very shallow sandbar in front of their harbor and as the ships got bigger they couldn't go across it so it was a pretty wise decision on everything but William Roach Jr. Um, was sent to New Bedford to pick up the pieces of the industry after the American Revolution. The American Revolution did a lot of damage to the whaling industry because all of a sudden we were favored trade status for a long time especially whale oil products because everything that was whale oil was going to England and France and all of a sudden we were the enemy so it did a lot of damage to us. William Roach Jr. was sent to New Bedford to pick up the pieces of the industry here, and he did so almost immediately. Um, the, because the city, the little town that was here was actually burned by the British in 1778 because of privateering. There was some privateering being done in New Bedford, and the British decided to come in here and destroy the place, which they did. Um, so they had to rebuild and re rejuvenate the uh, whaling industry, and it took them no time to do that. By 1790, he was doing great. Uh, New Bedford was making lots of money. He even, he even, in 1790, he wrote a letter to somebody, and he said, we sent out 600 tons of whale products this year, which was a lot. Whale what? Whale products, oil, candles. And, and he said, you know, and this is in 1790 now. He says, you know, I'm a little worried that there won't be enough whales at some point. Because all the whaling was being done in the Atlantic Ocean at the time. Well, that was solved the next year when a New Bedford ship called the Rebecca traversed the Cape of uh, Good Hope into the Pacific Ocean and all of a sudden 
there were more whales than you could count, basically. And so, but that meant there were longer whaling voyages, more investment, and then, but there was also, uh, it extended for the next 50 years, the industry into the golden age, golden age. And men like William Roach Jr. and many of the other houses that we've passed became millionaires. James Arnold was a millionaire in the 1820s. I mean, come on. William J. Roach was probably the most, was the most influential man in town. He paid the highest taxes in town. So he had be, obviously had to be making the most, plus they owned a ton of property as well. Um, and William Roach Jr. Was, was, he was involved in all sorts of civic affairs, schools, roads, police and fire, all that type of stuff he was supportive, he was supportive of. He lived on the waterfront actually. If, you, if you've been to the Siemens Bethel downtown, when you go to the visitor center, well you might not see it, but the, 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 the Mariner's home which is on the street that's right across from the Whaling Museum was his first house built in 1790. This was his second house. A lot of these people live very, very long lives. He was 91 when he passed away in, in 1850. Remember I mentioned uh, Elizabeth Roach Rodman, who was, the, who was involved with the schism? She lived to be 99. 99. She died in 1855 and born in, in 17, 1756. 99. So there's a lot of these people, incredibly, were long life. When the average lifespan for most people was probably 40. Um, they, they lived a long life. They probably, well, they worked hard enough. I think they just had better nutrition. They were eating better. Who knows? It had to be because something like that. Because the roaches lived a long life. A lot of people, there's a number of other people that I won't even mention that were also in the 90s and late, late 90s even. That's amazing. Anyway, he was very influential. Um, the whaling industry brought in lots of cash. And actually, all the money that the whaling industry brought to, the, to New Bedford prior to 1860, after that, um, the discovery of petroleum really put a, put, you know, signaled the end of big time commercial whaling. But um, there was still plenty of capital here, and all that capital eventually was transferred into the textile industry. Some of the great houses in New Bedford are these two here the, the Joseph Grinnell Mansion here and the William Roach Rodman house here. William Roach Rodman was a brother of Samuel Rodman Jr. He was not interested in plain design. When this house was built in the 1830s, it was probably one of the grandest houses ever built in New England at the time. Even in New Bedford, it was outclassed a couple years later by another house in the North End that has since been demolished. But when this house was built, there was no expense spared $60,000 in, in the early 1830s, which was a king's ransom to build a house. Um, and it's still really one of the great symbols of the wealth in New Bedford at the time. It's at the end of Hawthorne Street, which is one of New Bedford's most uh, fashionable and, and, and desirable streets. The hospital is down there, lots of mansions all along from, from start to finish on Hawthorne Street. And to come to the end of it here with this magnificent house is just like the symbol of, uh, of how grand the place was at one time. Um, he, was a, he was a very important whaling merchant. Joseph Grinnell was also a very, very important merchant and visionary for the town. He supported all of the 19th century improvements, the public water supply, the railroad. He was the one who started the first major textile mill, the Wamsutta Mill here in New Bedford. Very important guy. This house here, which, is, which was uh, a single family house at one point, it really didn't look, I mean, it's been modified tremendously, but when, it didn't really change its form that much when, the way we're looking at it now. And, a, and it was originally a, a, a Grinnell also owned this house, but in the late 19th century, a man by the name of Horatio Howland, uh, excuse me, Horatio Hathaway lived in this house. He started his own mill, the Hathaway Mill, and today that mill is Berkshire Hathaway, the uh, holding company for Warren Buffett. The Hathaway part of Berkshire Hathaway is the New Bedford's Hathaway Mill, which is in the south end. Remnants of the mill are still standing, um, but that's where that comes from. So. We have a direct connection. Buffett owned the building when it was still running as the Berkshire Hathaway Mill in the South End. 
It was the last textile mill to operate here in New Bedford. It closed in uh, 1985. Okay, this is um, the William J. Roach House, 1846. It's really the, the hallmark of the style um, that was popular briefly in the eight, late 1830s and 40s, the Gothic Revival in America. Um, the architect of this house is probably its most famous uh, uh, proponent. His name was Alexander Jackson Davis. Um, and this was really his calling, this ended up being his calling card house. He actually had it on his calling card, this house, this design. Um, it has all the, all the features of, of uh, the Gothic Revival, all the pointed arches. You can see them everywhere in the windows, um, of course, the main gable. Um, this, this spectacular gable decoration called the barge board or verge board, various, various uh, ways that they just describe that. Spectacular um, chimneys, and they still have the, you know, like we put in the owners, the previous owners, put in the chimney pots, which would have been authentic to this particular style. Um, just a spectacular uh, um, example of the style. <coughs> William J. Roach, um, he's the man that was willed the Wamsutta Club, the first building. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he left this house and rented it. The, ho the family that, owned, that built this house, the Roaches, owned this house until just recently. Now, the, it's a wood-sided house, but it's made to look like stone. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the houses in this style were built of stone or, or, and then stucco to be, to be a very smooth. But this is a wood-sided house, flush board, mm -hmm. made to look like stone. The interior of this house it's really quite modest, actually. Um, when you think of Grand Victorians, when you go into this house, this is, that's not what you think about. We have some beautiful Victorians. Um, we passed the street, Madison Street, that's beautiful Victorians. And the other portion of Madison Street, which is south, just, just west of here, has some beautiful Victorians. And they have that fabulous woodwork and so forth. But this house is quite modest on the inside. The spaces are decent, but, you know, when it was on, it's been on the house tour a couple times, and you go in and you're expecting, you know, what you see on the outside. It's, a little, it's just it's quite plain, actually. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, beautiful house, has landmark status here. Um, William J. Roach was one of the most influential members of the, of the city in his lifetime. Um, the last of the wealthy Roaches. Um, he moved into the Wamsa uh, Club, as I mentioned, and he was a mayor for a while. He owned a lots of businesses, was involved in all sorts of things. And um, um, so that's the story on him. Right next door was another magnificent, beautiful sto uh, brick Italian mansion, and it was um, the home of Jonathan Bourne. And Jonathan Bourne is an interesting man. He was born in Sandwich, Mass., and he was very successful. I could talk all day about him. But he managed in his lifetime, he was a member of the legislature for a while. He managed so to have. Was he? He, was, he was born around 1800 and died around 1889. I think he died in 1889. He did die in 1889. He was in the legislature. And he managed not only to have a section of Sandwich detached to become a separate town, he got the town to name it after him. Born is named after Jonathan Bourne in his lifetime. He removed that. It's not just an accident. Oh, oh, gee, he was a famous man. No, 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 no. He worked at it. He worked at getting the town to name it after himself, and it is named after Jonathan Bourne, who lived in the site right here all his life, for the most, all his, uh, all his uh, successful life, uh, had a section of sandwich named after him, and it's the town of Bourne. <laughs> that is the tour. Um, for today, if you have any questions, we're going to walk back to the club. Um, if you find any questions, we'll walk in there if you, anything occurs to you. Um, you are exceptional. Thank you. Oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you.